This is the New American Media. All right, we are back. Special guest Rob Troutman from Sports on Tap. Follow him on Twitter at SOT Podcast. Rob, let's talk Cleveland Browns, shall we? It has been an insane couple of weeks. Can you walk us through what happened? Is it a good thing or a great thing? Because I really don't think it's a bad thing at this point. I could be wrong. Put me in place if I'm totally out of line here. But just, just kind of give us an update. What in the hell is going on in Berea? Yeah, you know, it's been just when you thought it couldn't get any more hectic. Uh, you know, the Browns um, hired Mike Pettin away from Buffalo, and and I think the reason they did it, and um, you know, they were also interested in Dan Quinn, who's the defensive coordinator of, at Seattle, um, and I think that was more of Joe Banner's guy. But when it when it was heard that Mike Pettin said, you know, if it goes another week, he's going to pull out of the running. The Browns weren't necessarily sure that Dan Quinn would take the job because he wanted till after wanted to wait till after the Super Bowl. Right. So the Browns um, and I, and more or less I think it was Jimmy Haslam really liked Mike Pettin. Um, he wanted to hire him right away and didn't want to take a chance in losing out. I mean, you lose out on Mike Pettin and then Dan Quinn doesn't take the job, then you're kind of in a rough spot. Then where do you go from there? Bernie Kosar. So they, Bernie Kosar. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? You might or maybe Mike Golick. <laughs> or Bob Golick, rather. He's uh, he's still in Cleveland. But, uh, you know, they Mike Pettin's a guy that turned around the Bills' defense into a top-10 defense. When he was with the Jets, they were a top-5 defense. He brought along Jim O'Neill, who's that defensive coordinator, and uh, Kyle Shanahan's the offensive coordinator who comes from Washington. Both young guys who um, I think have a pretty nice passion for the game of football and, and have proven that – you know, they can be pretty successful. They, you know, their track record. Kyle Shanahan is a has a nice track record. Jim O'Neill, um, I believe, was the linebackers coach at Buffalo, and now he's going to be promoted to the defensive coordinator. So you had all the hirings with uh, special teams. They kept uh, Chris Tabor, who was, um, you know, the special teams coach for the Browns. They retained him. Is that usual? Which, uh, is, is that usual that they would expected. keep that they would keep one of the assistants? Because uh, uh, you don't really hear about that too much, where they would keep somebody on. Yeah, and they kept a few other guys as well. But, yeah, they you know, you keep some guys. I, I have seen it, but it's not too often because you usually want a clean house. But once they got their staff in order, then, you know, it calmed down for maybe a week here. And you didn't hear anything. You know, everybody was talking about the Browns for a while. But then all of a sudden, you know, out of the blue – uh, Mike Lombardi was fired, and Joe Banner is going to step down. And, you know, Joe Banner set up the Browns. I think he was trying to train kind of Jimmy Haslam and how to run a football team. But, um, you know, I think a lot of it is those three, I think, all bumped heads a little bit. You know, Joe Banner, I think, wanted a lot of control. But Jimmy Haslam, I think, also wanted to uh, have some kind of say in some of the guys they hired. And Mike Lombardi, you know, he obviously didn't talk to the media very much. And, uh, according to other media sources, they told me that it's probably better off because he was a loose cannon and not respected by some of the players, you know, with his attitude around uh, around the players and the media in general, and he was very arrogant. Um, but they, they uh, respected Joe Banner but didn't agree with a lot of his moves necessarily. And I think uh, – Jimmy Haslam realized, you know, that there wasn't a very good perception of the front office in Cleveland, and I think he wanted that to change. Well, and, and you know, looking at what it takes to bounce these people out of there, you, you starting to hear stories about how the league was pretty much forcing Joe Banner onto Haslam as a precondition to buying the team in the first place. Have you followed that component? Yeah, and, and that is true that, you know, the NFL thought Joe Banner would be a good guy to kind of get Jimmy Haslam on his feet and teach him the ropes and how to run an organization, um, especially in the NFL franchise. And, you know, that's what Jimmy Haslam said in his press conference, is that Joe Banner really taught him and made him understand logistics and, and how an NFL franchise needs to be run. And now, you know, Joe Banner... I mean, he said it's a sweet sorrow to you know to leave, but he's not leaving yet. He'll be around for I think a few more months. But I think you know they just wanted to, to see him, I guess, get you know Jimmy Haslam's feet wet a little bit and, and teach him how to run uh, the the franchise. And uh, you know, I guess once um, they started, you know, they, I know Joe Banner's a guy of power. He wants to do a lot of things, and uh, 
I think Jimmy Haslam is a guy that wants to be more involved, and he just, again, um, didn't like what was happening with the front office. I mean, you know, calling these guys the Three Stooges. They, Joe Banner even made a joke about it during Mike Pettin's uh, press conference, saying we got the third stooge in Mike Pettin to join me and Mike, you know, joking around about that. And I don't think that was too funny to Jimmy Haslam, and he didn't necessarily like it. But, yeah, the NFL did you know, place these guys together, and I think it's worth to welcome out now. And real quick, Joe Banner's background, he was also the one that, that taught Jimmy Haslam how to run the rebate program with the Flying J <laughs> company. Is that correct? You know, he might have. But uh, <laughs> don't don't take that for granted. And, you know, that's – I don't want to be quoted on that one. But, no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. But, but, yeah. but, I mean, it's it's legitimate. The owner of the Cleveland Browns <laughs> is, is, is under – uh wow! Yeah. What is the technical legal term under suspicion? Uh, was it the FBI's investigating? Yeah, still. I don't know if they're investigating him. I mean, and there were questions during the press conference about that, but he wanted it to be about the Cleveland Browns and uh, keep the focus obviously off Pilot <laughs> Flying J right now. Um, and you know, we haven't heard a lot about that right now. Um, that's kind of been in the background. Um, but Mike Pence said that didn't affect any, you know, anything with him being a coach there he doesn't worry about that he worries about the Cleveland Browns and you know I think they have a plan in place regardless you know if he does have to leave the team for a while I think he said his dad would would take over responsibilities for the team so I I I believe that they do have a plan in place in case anything did happen well you know and you've only been on the program a couple of times Rob but I also do an agree to disagree program it's political and often on the unhappy hour I'll, I'll bl- blur the lines a little bit here and, and what it kind of reminds me of and, and there's a legitimate reason why I'm bringing this up um, but I'm going to make that segue a little bit here is the Benghazi situation from not too long ago on, on the September 11th and, and embassy over um, was was attacked in Libya and, and our mm-hmm. diplomat Chris Stevens was murdered and, and some Navy SEALs were killed Hillary Clinton famously uh, what difference at this point does it make and in all the investigations and all the unanswered questions where was the president who who didn't call in backup why didn't you send for help why were they there on September 11th anyway why didn't you increase the 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 staff for protection all this stuff what I have reached a conclusion in that particular political uh, I don't even call it a scandal it's it's way worse with dead bodies but my opinion is either Hillary was completely incompetent to not read the emails and the cables that were coming from the embassy, begging them for extra security, saying things are spiraling out of control here, it's dangerous, I fear for my life, we need more people, and she actually cut the staff. So either she's complicit or she is incompetent. And, and now I'll, I'll bring it back to sports here because I don't need your comment there unless you want to jump in on that. <laughs> um, but, but with Jimmy Haslam, with the Flying J thing. Either he was involved with it, or he's completely oblivious to a major scandal going on inside of his own corporation, which lends the question, hmm, well, does he really have a grip on what the Browns are doing in his organization? You fire a head coach at less than 365 days after you hire him. You bring in your GM and, and your CEO only to fire them as well. You trade away your running back a couple games into the season. It just seems like everything is either he doesn't know or he's almost playing that game in a major league where you're trying to intentionally tank the team. So I don't necessarily think that's what's going on, but I mean, with Jimmy has, let me focus now, direct question to Rob. Um, (laughs) That was my internal, uh, that little bubble (laughs) above my head. Uh, You guys all got to hear it. Direct question to you. Do you think it's possible that it's an either or Jimmy Haslam was involved in, in the rebate scandal or he's completely clueless and he shouldn't be trusted to run companies? You know, that's a tough one because, you know, I, I almost find it hard to believe he wouldn't know that that's kind of going on. I mean, and, you know, unless, you know, you're trying to think of, you know, the salespeople and everybody else they've already arrested, what, um, you know, who who organized that and did they have incentives to do that? Because it just seems very odd that he would have no clue what's going on but then again he is you know running how many pilot flying jays all over the place so it is tough to you know kind of know everything and anything going on with such a big company like that so i can't understand you know maybe it seems like everything's being run well but you know maybe some things are being hidden but uh, you know it's tough for 
I mean, it can go one half a dozen one way, half a dozen the other way. But you know, it's it's really a tough situation, and you know, I'm interested to see what they find. I find it hard to believe right now, after all the investigation and everything going on, that we still really aren't any closer to knowing right. what's going on with the rebate wow, thing. And I, I find that interesting to me. You know that what? We I, haven't heard anything in a while. I feel the same way about Benghazi, Hillary and Barack Obama. I, I, I still feel like I don't know what happened. Were they intentionally setting Chris Stevens up? Were they trying to pull an October surprise before the election, like in Wag the Dog, where you bring out Woody Harrelson, good old shoe, we rescued him from behind enemy lines? Or was it part of an arms deal gone wrong through Syria into Libya, uh, or, or through Turkey into Syria? I feel like I don't have any answers to Benghazi, just like I don't have any answers to the Flying J uh, rebate program. Yeah, I, Be- because my thing yeah, is, I, go ahead, yeah, Rob. Go ahead. No, no, all you. Um, I, I was going to say with with a lot of this, I I don't think anybody's ever possibly going to know what happens in these situations. I think you know, like you said, maybe some stuff is swept under the rug, and you know, they want a perception out there that you know a lot of us are never going to know you know, all the the details of this stuff. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate that stuff like this happens. Um, But, you know, I I think if if he knew anything, I mean, he knew anything about it. I mean, he has to, uh, you know, face what he has coming. And, uh, you know, I just find it interesting that after, you know, they arrested how many people already and, uh, you know, went into his building and, and got filed and everything like that. And, how, I mean, I know there's a ton of files probably that have to go through, but how long has it been now? I mean, it's yeah. been months and months, and we still are no closer to knowing what happened with the rebate and who's responsible at the top of it right now. And in, in, in full disclosure, I do intend to own the Cleveland Browns. So, you know, I will perhaps sometime <laughs> soon have to negotiate a deal with Jimmy Haslam, and I'm not talking ill about him unnecessarily. I'm just covering a story that doesn't seem to go away because we don't have answers. And and one of the – I'm actually not kidding about wanting to buy the Browns. But anyway, um, one of the things <laughs> that, that I would like – to understand is so it, it, it it's a corporation so they have they have shareholder meetings once a month with the board of directors I'm, I'm I serve on several different boards of directors for my homeowner association with my Masonic Lodge uh, I've been on boards of directors with my own company so my question is <clears throat> when you have the 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 treasurer that goes through the numbers oh and by the way we're worth forty seven thousand dollars extra revenue that we can't seem to account for. Oh, that's a weird month. Have you fi- Did you check this? No, okay. Well, how about that? Mm, no, it wasn't that. Could it have been a shipment that got refund? No, no, it wasn't. Okay, well, well, let's take a look, do some research, and we'll meet again at the next month meeting. I, I find it hard to believe how many months would have had to pass where the treasurer com- always said, you know, we have a lot of extra money in here. Um, my numbers just aren't adding up. Maybe it's a glitch in my Excel program, but... You know, I'd, how many months does it take? It, it seems very intentional. And at the yeah, board of directors that's, meeting, that's how like do you, you not say, catch it? I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, with all those meetings, I mean, how how was it kept a secret, especially to a guy that's basically in charge of the whole entire business? If he's paying and, attention, uh, you know, and I, if he's I find it hard to believe. But then again, he's innocent until proven guilty, and uh, we haven't heard anything new here. Um, and, you know, he doesn't obviously want to talk about because he doesn't want to put the Browns in that kind of spotlight, which I completely understand, keeping his business separate from the Cleveland Browns. So there's, you know, when he gets questions at a Browns press conference, I understand why he, he doesn't want to uh, answer those questions. But uh, at the same time, I'm surprised we haven't heard anything yet. It's just, uh, and I'll, I'll wrap this up on Jimmy Haslam, it's just there have been so many erratic uh, unconventional moves, from, like I said, from trading Richardson, cleaning out Lombardi, cleaning out Joe Banner, firing Chud less than mm-hmm. a year in. Uh, you know, it, it it just seems like a lot of erratic behavior. Where if this was my buddy, I'd wonder if he was on drugs, and I'd I have to talk to him. Hey, man, you know, you seem to be making some weird decisions here, man. You know, like we care for you and have an intervention or something. You know, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe it's all going to turn around, and we're in the playoffs next year and win a Super Bowl. Who knows? But. Well- well, and I will say this for him. Remember that he is a first-time uh, owner of a, you know, of an NFL franchise, and, and maybe he's learning as he goes right now. Where you know there are going to be mistakes early on, whether it's hiring personnel and finding exactly what he's looking for, because he came from the Pittsburgh Steelers, so he saw it one way, and I think it was a little bit opposite in his first year of owning the Browns, where you know he hired who he thought would fit the organization and and fit the principles like the Pittsburgh Steelers have. But in the 
end, it wasn't exactly the way he thought it would turn out. So that's why he said, instead of letting this go on, you know, for years, let's make a change now and get the personnel in here that I believe fit. Because I think, uh, you know, like like you said, you know, he's a first-time owner, so mistakes are going to happen, and it's going to be trial by error probably in that first year. But uh, I think he wants to get things on track, and and he just didn't like what was happening around the front office. And, uh, you know, winning only four games with six Pro Bowlers, I don't think he saw that as uh, – you know, respectable, and the fans of Cleveland obviously weren't happy. But you know, it's it's tough to say. But uh, I'll I'll see what he can do. I still believe in Jimmy Haslam. I think he's a good owner for the Cleveland Browns. Um, you know, he's a dedicated guy. That's you know, obviously going to get in front of the media and talk to talk to them, tell them what's going on. But uh, he invests a lot of money with his team. I mean, he's still paying Chud ten and a half million dollars. You know, because he cut him the first year. So I mean. You know, if you're if you're an NFL coach, you know why wouldn't you want the Cleveland Browns job? <laughs> I, I mean, seriously. yeah, you have a one in three so. chance of, of getting uh, several years of paid vacation. I, I'll say this about Mike Pettin. Um, before Mike Pettin, I, I want to like Jimmy Haslam. I want him to be, become a winner and become the best owner in, in all of the Cleveland franchises. I, I obviously want that. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, a couple of years in, I mean, what, what am I really hanging my hat on? But what I do like about Mike Pettin, two things. I like about Mike Pettin that, that he saw the opportunity. And if, you're, if you've ever played poker, Rob, and I, I don't know, by the way, do you ever play poker, Rob? Yes. Well, sometimes in poker, you just you get that sense. You just have that mm-hmm. feeling. I don't, you know, in rounders wants to make you think it's an Oreo twist or something, uh, and that's not necessarily the case of a tell. But sometimes you're tapped into a weakness. You notice, aha, I'm cl- I'm calling BS on this, and I'm going to push all my chips in here to prove it. And I think that's exactly what Mike Pettin did with the whole fiasco of waiting for Dan Quinn and mm-hmm. what's going on with McDaniels. He's out, then he wants back in, but he doesn't want to say that he's yeah. back in. And uh, what's going on with with, with Gase over in uh, uh, Denver? You know, and, oh, what about what about uh, Shiano coming back up from Tampa Bay? You know, I, I think Pettin sensed. I got a shot at this. I'm moving all my chips in. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Heslam. I would definitely take your head coaching position, but you have 12 hours to make your decision or else I'm withdrawing my name. I'm going to go uh, <clears throat> have dinner. I love that move. That is a ballsy, that is a gutsy, all-in, chips-in-the-middle-of-the-table kind of move. And you know what? That, that might be what you need to win in the AFC North and to win a Super Bowl. And I liked his quote. He said, this team is going to be built on toughness. To play in the AFC North, you have to be willing to bloody your nose. And I mean, just right away, I don't know much about Mike Pettin. But I, I like his bluff. He called the bluff, and he, he changed the power structure from Jimmy Haslam and Joe Banner and Mike Lombardi and all these other characters to, <clears throat> excuse me, I am now in charge, and you can hire me unless I withdraw my name, which is coming in, oh, 10 minutes, make your move. I love that he did that, and that gives me hope that he might be a decent coach, and I like that he said you have to be willing to bloody your nose. Thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, and one thing he said in the press conference, too, is he's going to hold players accountable. And one thing he liked that he did with other teams are um, after every practice, he gave the players a grade. And uh, he said, you know, every performance is going to be uh, characterized. And, I mean, he wants he wants his players to play hard. And that's what you get a good sense. He's like, I don't want to win this press conference. I want to win football games. And, uh, you know, that means more to me. He's like, you know, I want obviously the fans to, you know, love and enjoy this Cleveland franchise and the football team. And, uh, you know, one reason he told Jimmy Haslam that he needed to make up his mind, otherwise he's pulling out, is because he, he really appreciated and respected the Buffalo Bills organization. And it was getting to a time where Buffalo could have had an issue um getting a defensive quarter now they hired Jim Schwartz right away but you know it was getting to the point where who knows Jim Schwartz could have signed on with another team and um, he didn't want to leave Buffalo in that uh, predicament because he was he was close to Doug Marone I mean he went out on a limb and hired him as a defensive coordinator and uh, gave him a chance and he respected that so he's, he's a guy that definitely respects you know the NFL I like his attitude his toughness um, making sure the players are accountable for, you know, their their plays, you know, their actions. And uh, I think, you know, he is that guy that he's going to be pumped up on the field. 
he wants his team to really leave it all on the field. And, you know, sometimes you see coaches that are laid back, like a Pat Shermer who is here. I mean, I don't think I saw one smile. I don't think I saw one fist pump out of Pat Shermer on the sidelines, which, you know, if – if you're a good coach, you don't really even care about that, but you like to see some kind of energy, and I think you saw that with Mike Pettin in his first press conference. Well, let me do this. Uh, Rob Troutman from Sports on Tap. Follow him on Twitter at SOT Podcast. Uh, a bit of a lightning round here because it's been a crazy Valentine's Day across the board. Guest before you, guest <laughs> after you, and we got a bounce. We already kept him waiting a little bit. Yep. Thankfully, he's such a generous human being that he's okay with his time being stretched <laughs> like this. Um, but real quick, let, let's go through. Um, we're about three months away from the draft. It's What is it, May 8th, I believe? A little less than three months. If you are sitting at number four, are you content to pick at number four? Do you want to trade? And who do you think will be there to snatch up? Does it have to be a quarterback? I, I think it's going to be a quarterback. I think, you know, it's tough to say which one. You know, Johnny Manziel was quoted today yeah, I um, saw saying that. a lot of good things about the Browns, and I know the fans are pretty excited about that. But it almost seems like the Texans might snatch him with the first overall pick, possibly. Um, and, you know, I can see Blake Bortles going to the Browns or Teddy Bridgewater at number four. I don't think the Browns are going to trade up. Yes, they do have draft picks, which they could. It depends if they really feel like they want to get a certain quarterback and they feel he's going to go. I mean, if they feel that highly that he's going to be a franchise quarterback, you know, I think you have to trade up and, and trade some of your picks to get the number one pick. But if you feel like there's other quarterbacks that are pretty close, that can run your franchise, I think you stay at number four. And if you're at number four, who do you expect to be on the board? Is there is there any anybody you like more than the others? Because a lot of people you say, know, hey, it's one of the three. Yeah. They're all pretty good. Uh, nobody's standing out like, this is Andrew Luck. you got to take him. And they're all pretty good. Yeah, I would agree. There's really, you know, Blake Bortles is a, a pretty good-sized quarterback with a good arm. Um, Johnny Manziel makes plays. You know, and he already said, uh, you know, he wanted to take the Browns. He doesn't care how many quarterbacks the Browns have gone through. He wants to take them to the Super Bowl. I liked it. But, you know, he's an, he's an athletic quarterback that I think will make a lot of plays. The one thing you worry about is him getting injured with mm -hmm. his size. But uh, Teddy Bridgewater, another guy that has a strong arm, good movement in the pocket, pocket awareness and everything like that, I think he, he could also be a good quarterback. So with all three of those, they, they add a little bit of different um, – playmaking ability I would say but uh, all are pretty close and you know it, it depends do the Browns want I, I think they'll go quarterback but who knows maybe they'll go with a player like Sammy Watkins out of Clemson who you saw what he could do with versus Ohio, Ohio State, with State his speed. Yeah. But, but at the same time when I looked at that game did he run any kind of routes to me they were all you know screens that popped out of the side and he showed good speed but I want to see if he can run some good, solid routes and get open, other than just popping out to the side and running. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities, but I think the Browns definitely need a quarterback. And I think, uh, you know, in that first with the first four picks, I think there's going to be a good opportunity for them to do that. Do you think they go Ben Tate? Who do they do at running back? Do they try to get wait, hope that Carlos Hyde's going to be there with their their second first round pick, or try to snatch him snatch him up in the second round? And will will Brian Hoyer get a chance to step in and play? To, double sided yeah. question. Yeah, Bri Brian Hoyer is no doubt. I mean, they need a veteran quarterback on this team, and he is that veteran. And I think he's going to have a great chance to start. Um, if the Browns draft a, a rookie quarterback, you know, I can see them trying to battle it out, but Brian or you're probably being the guy. Now, as far as Ben Tate, I really like Ben Tate, but the, it worries me that he gets hurt a little bit. Same you know, he was out a lot this year. I like his potential, but, uh, you know, it does worry me that his, he's injury prone. Um, you know, it might not be a bad option, but I'd kind of like to see, you know, a younger running back that maybe has more potential. I think signing Ben Tate is high risk high reward uh, for the Cleveland Browns yeah he was on my fantasy team and he was injured a lot so I, I I'm going Carlos Hyde that that boy showed me a lot of toughness so uh, final question yeah. here and we'll let you get going uh, how excited are you one to ten for the movie draft day with Kevin Costner you know what I would say it's about a seven or eight I heard good reviews Same on it here, um, yeah. you, you know I I'm interested to see really what the Browns front office taught 
Kevin Costner and Jennifer <laughs> Gardner and, and those people because uh, I, I heard it's a pretty interesting movie, um, and, and I definitely want to see it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's definitely out there. I, I'm not a guy that goes to the movie theater every weekend because it costs $40 to see a movie, so I'll wait till it comes out. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty excited to see it. I thought it was pretty cool that they were here in Cleveland. And, you know, hey, Cleveland's getting just as many movies as L.A. out there, uh, you know, <laughs> nowadays. They're starting to do, a, well, you know, I'm being sarcastic there, but they are getting some movies here in Cleveland. And, uh, you know, we'll have to wait for your next movie. When are you, you going to make a movie and come to Cleveland here? Yeah, that's going to be so an early... Come back to your roots. That's going to be early 2015. Early 2015. I'm going to get a nice <laughs> home maybe in the suburbs or on the outer skirts of the suburbs. Uh, a couple of there acres, a little organic farm. Oh, yeah, I was actually talking about that today. Are yeah. you going to close down the freeway for a month? To uh, <laughs> yeah, Is it going to be that kind of big movie? No, no, no. Mine will be a psychological thriller about how to save a, a corrupt global governance. Uh, from taking over all the, the rights and liberties and freedoms from Man, just the average hard working people. That. Yeah, and then I'll work in sports somehow. And it's about sports, by the way, too. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be a Save the World buddy flick about sports. No, anyway. But hey, Rob, thank you so much for joining us on just a very bizarre <laughs> Valentine's Day lineup here at the TNAM Radio Network. Once again, follow Rob Troutman. He's on Twitter. Sports on Tap is the name of what he does on Twitter. He's at SOT Podcast. Rob, thanks for joining us again. We will do this again. There's going to be a lot of a lot of more Browns talk in the next few months. And um, by the way, I, I didn't tell you, but you are a part of the New American Media. You're on our team, so welcome aboard. And we look forward to having you back on the program sometime soon. All right, buddy. Hey, that sounds good, Brian. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right, you take care. There goes Rob Troutman. Everybody coming up on deck. Dan Johnson with Panda. Here we go. Now it gets real. <laughs> 